the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Anarchism and Literature in France, a Complex Love Affair by Vittorio Frigerio. Let's start with a quote. There are signs that indicate clearly when an idea is gaining ground. The last 20 years of the 19th century, the last 10 most of all, have seen the birth of a complex, truly anarchist literature. On the one hand, theoreticians expose and develop the anarchist notions and the philosophy from which these notions derive. On the other, a large mass of artists present under various guises the great moral and philosophical problems that are at the basis of the anarchist worldview. Anarchist scientific works, works of art, dramas, novels, anarchist poems appear everywhere, and we can now safely state that anarchism has become the new orientation of humanity. These words were written at the turn of the 20th century by André Girard, one of the main contributors to Jean Grave's newspaper Les Temps Nouveaux, France's most prominent anarchist publication. Their optimistic outlook was soon to be disproven by stubborn reality, but his analysis of the appearance of a wide variety of explicitly anarchist works in practically all cultural domains at the time, and first of all in the literary field, was indeed spot on. In this podcast we will have a look at some aspects of the complex relationship between anarchism and literature in France during the heyday of the expansion of the anarchist movement. But to fully understand it, we will first need to step back a bit and look at it from the perspective of one of anarchism's original and most influential philosophers, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Between 1847 and 1850, Proudhon issued a series of newspapers with nearly identical titles, minor changes designed to overcome the government's repeated attempts at prohibiting their publication. Le représentant du peuple, le peuple, la voix du peuple, and finally, le peuple de 1850. These were dailies with a print run ranging from 20,000 to 100,000 copies. Proudhon's journalistic activity is concomitant with one of the moments of greatest energy in the world of French literature, with the development, triumph, and later decadence of Romanticism, whose birth coincided with the Revolution of 1830 and, even more importantly, the development of the roman feuilleton, the serialized novels that were published every day in newspapers and devoured by a newly literate public hungry for entertainment. Although Proudhon's analysis of what ailed society focused overwhelmingly on the economy and in particular on the notion of property, Literature and culture could not be ignored on the pages of his newspapers, and this all the more since some of the most significant authors of the time were also engaged in politics or aspiring to a political career. The poet Lamartine, who had started his political career in 1830, is a member of the provisional government of the Second Republic after the Revolution of 1848. Victor Hugo also sits on the benches of the Chamber of Deputies since that same year. But even the two most read and controversial authors 
of serial pot boilers of the time, Alexandre Dumas and Eugène Sue, try with varying degrees of success to enter the political arena. Sue, a dandy turned disciple of Fourier, espouses positions that even Proudhon, who has embarked on a mission to convert the bourgeoisie to the new socialist ideas, finds strategically unadvisable. But the incredible popularity of the author of The Mysteries of Paris, who liberally spikes his novels with explicit political commentary dealing with such controversial matters as penal reform, leads Proudhon to adopt an ambivalent attitude in his regard. While he instructs his journalists not to provide any publicity to this writer's electoral ambitions, he comments favorably on the educational usefulness of Sue's writing. Proudhon explicitly prefers historical or sociological works over fiction, but he admits that the novel can have an important pedagogical value for the people and lauds Sue for having been able to explain to his readers the true nature of the Jesuit threat to society in his novel The Wandering Jew better than any treatise could have done. Torn between his deep mistrust of writers just looking for fame and money in his view, and the obvious advantages the novels can offer in terms of propaganda due to their ever-growing popularity, Proudhon appears undecided. He criticizes emphatically modern novels and their authors for their shortcomings. In terms of content, as well as of form. Historical novels, the dominant genre, those of Dumas and Hugo first of all, are for him poorly written and dissolute. They spread immorality. In that, his position is indistinguishable from that of the conservative critics of his time. But more importantly, novels for him are also a waste of time and distract their readers from more urgent matters, delaying the day of the social revolution. In this, Proudhon ushered in an attitude that will be shared by the wider revolutionary left well into the 20th century, and does much to create the reputation of anti-intellectualism that will dog the anarchist movement all through its heyday. The useless novel, says Proudhon, simply reflects the shortcomings of its authors. Dumas and Hugo, the most common targets, are egotistical social climbers, venal profiteers, only interested in marketing their brand. Pretend aristocrats, one supposedly a viscount, the other a marquis, would like to play a being part of the people and would like to represent them without ever having shared their lives. Proudhon sees his time as an era of decadence. His literary ideal dates from the previous century. It is classical theater that he appreciates because of its instructional value and sees as an example of what art should be like and most of all, what it should do. Romanticism, the overly imaginative son of the revolution of 1830, who did not keep its promise of cultural renovation the same way as the revolution itself did not fulfill its promise of social equality, is to be condemned because of its pessimism. It incites youth to be passive in front of life's obstacles, to give up, and as is often the case in many a play, to prefer supposedly noble theatrical suicide to the difficult, drawn-out fight against oppression. But while Proudhon and his colleagues regularly expressed their mistrust of writers and uh, 
subordinate literature to just about any other form of knowledge, be it philosophy, science, or sociology. Their newspapers themselves offer the readers a number of serialized novels and a critical discourse meant to justify them. In several articles, some unsigned and likely by Proudhon himself, some by Taxil Delors, a longtime collaborator, Le Peuple presents its vision of what real literature should be. But while the modern novel is pitilessly criticized, Proudhon's newspaper's own serialized productions are not so far removed from what can be found in the bourgeois press. Or at least, they are similar in style and tone, but different in the subject matter. The novel's power is to be able to persuade through feeling instead of appealing to reason. Those in Proudhon's papers will therefore mostly propose revolutionary themes, such as a retelling of the failed revolution of 1832, while essentially remaining true to the aesthetics of the historical novel as practiced by the Romantic writers. In those years of rapid expansion of the daily press, France has a surfeit of young writers looking for ways of launching a career. The editors of Le Peuple know that the feuilleton is the most appealing feature of a newspaper for a large part of the reading public and can count on aspiring, idealistic authors hailing from the provinces, ready to try their hand at writing fiction steeped in revolutionary themes. Proudhon's papers did not last long and the harsh censorship of the Second Empire prevented these experiments from bearing fruit. But the ambivalent love story of anarchism and literature continued in different ways over the years. The anarchist press was revived starting in 1879 with the creation in Geneva by Peter Kropotkin of Le Révolté. This newspaper taken over by Jean Grave in Paris, became Le Temps Nouveau and was published right up to and beyond the First World War. It offered a semi-monthly literary supplement that represented a first systematic attempt to establish constructive connections between the anarchist movement and contemporary literature, offering excerpts of works from known writers that reflected anarchist concerns. The goal was to prove the value of the anarchist worldview by pointing out how great writers of the past and known contemporary authors could come to the same conclusions as the libertarian theorists, independently of their class, education, or social status. As the common saying goes, les grands esprits se rencontrent, great minds think alike. Jean Grave highlighted proto-anarchist analysis in the writings of luminaries from past centuries, such as Rabelais, Voltaire, or Diderot, and served his readers carefully chosen excerpts from modern writers, some of them objectively progressive, such as Emile Zola and the naturalists, but some also from entirely opposite ideological horizons, just as long as they attacked the same targets. It was not uncommon for Le Temps Nouveau to present anti-bourgeois and anti-capitalist rants from the likes of ultra-Catholic author Léon Blois, or anti-Semitic pamphleteer Édouard Drummond. The enemies of one's enemies are not necessarily friends, but they can become unlikely allies if read properly. Following Le Temps Nouveau and all through the last two decades of the 19th century, the anarchist press 
showed incredible resilience and vitality in the face of constant state repression. New titles multiplied exponentially. Amongst them, odd publications like L'En Dehors by Zo Daxa, an individualist who shunned all labels but promoted typically libertarian positions while publishing authors such as Saint Paul Roux, Félix Fénéon, Émile Ferraren, Camille Mauclair, and many others, often close to the symbolist movement. It is thanks to these encounters on the pages of such publications or in the courts of law that an equivalency started to become fashionable between anarchism and symbolism. After all, did not symbolist journals like La Plume publish scores of young authors whose anarchist sympathies were obvious? Did not the great poet Stéphane Mallarmé appear as a character witness for Félix Fénéon during the famed trial of the 30 in 1894, at the height of anti-anarchist repression? Isn't symbolist aesthetics concerned with deconstructing language the literary equivalent of the anarchist bomb blowing up society? Maybe so, to a limited extent anyway, but many of the attention-seeking young symbolists who flirted with anarchism at the time found out it was not in their best interests to keep such dangerous acquaintances and distanced themselves from the movement. Militants saw this as a betrayal, but many more aspiring writers, often self-taught, less concerned with theoretical literary debates and labels, kept providing the anarchist press with their creations in the service of the cause. Styles varied widely. Émile Pouget, creator of the weekly Le Père Pénard, a particularly virulent broadsheet, published outrageously funny satirical novels in installments written in his own version of Parisian slang. Le Libertaire, one of the main newspapers associated with the communist syndicalist wing of the anarchist movement, included short stories with a clear naturalist bent. Social critique was always the main goal of these publications. Space was expensive, and readers would often complain if it was taken up by writings they did not consider immediately useful to propaganda. But in spite of that, it was rare for a libertarian paper not to present in one form or another some literary creations. Outside of the circles where official culture was defined, clearly anarchist writers staked out their own territory. Louise Michel, the fearless militant of the Commune of Paris, became a prolific novelist. Georges Darien, whose novel Biribi brought attention to the inhuman conditions in the disciplinary battalions in North Africa, wrote a series of books that would gain him posthumous recognition as one of the most original voices of his time. Many writers who came of age in the period between the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century built a considerable body of work, either in the militant press or with small marginal publishers, and acquired a true faithful following among the working classes sympathetic to the cause. In the period between the two world wars, many more talented authors were still mostly waiting to be rediscovered, published their fiction on the pages of newspapers like L'Insurgé, Le Summer de Normandie, or The Pacifist, La Patrie Humaine. 
In spite of Proudhon's original mistrust, shared by many, a multifaceted and lively literary creation, explicitly anarchist, developed in France before the catastrophe of the Second World War and the progressive weakening of the movement's political importance. Not wedded to any one style or aesthetics, it was as diverse as its many practitioners and brought forward a comprehensive critique of society's shortcomings. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.